Welcome back to Media Monarchy, everybody. It's James Evan Pilato, your host, webmaster, DJ, and so much more from MediaMonarchy.com. You know, Morrissey, back in 1989, in a song said, In our lifetime, those who kill, the news world hands them stardom. And it wasn't just in the late 80s that he was talking about, because it happened in the late... 1890s as well, and author Stephen Livingston has a book called Little Demon in the City of Light, a true story of murder and mesmerism in Belle Epoque, Paris. And murder and mesmerism and the media are some of my favorite subjects, and I really enjoyed the book, so I'm really glad we've got Stephen Livingston on the line. Thanks so much for talking to us on Media Monarchy. Thanks for having me. So I guess initially we should probably just give a thumbnail sketch of what this was in 1898, this, this murder trial of a Little Demon. If you can just give, give listeners just a quick thumbnail sketch of that. Well, the Little Demon was a woman in, who, was committed, who committed a crime in 1889. Um, she claimed she, she murdered a man with an accomplice who was an older man who was um, sort of a con artist. And she claimed that um, she had been hypnotized to commit the murder. Um, this was at a time in Paris when hypnotism was a very popular thing. And there were all sorts of hypnotism shows that were on and, and um, academics were studying it in, in hospitals and universities. And there were two sides really to this, to this controversy, whether hypnotism, whether a person under hypnosis could commit a crime and particularly murder or um, whether that was impossible. So the crime sort of distilled discussion about that particular issue and created an absolute uproar in Paris in that, at that time. What, what kind of drew you to this story? Because there's a lot of elements in it, and some of the critics and things have said, you know, oh, it's like, you know, CSI meets, you know, a, something a little more fantastical. It, it, was it sort of the forensic elements? Was it the sort of the media spectacle of it? What drew it to you? Well, it was really everything, but most important, I think, for me was the culture at the time in Paris. It was just the most wild era that I had ever I had ever heard of or read about in in history, where something like this could occur. It could this kind of trial, this kind of um, crime, really could have occurred at no other time. Um, it was the it was the time of you know when the Eiffel Tower was just going up it was the time of the great actress Sarah Bernhardt who was really a crazy woman who you know had a coffin that someone gave to her and she slept in it at the foot of her bed it was you know a time when um people were just given over to wild excesses and this case basically was an example of of a wild excess and it was a time when the media also was was um really starting to kick up dust it was there was a lot of um of different newspapers selling for a very small amount and they were competing um wildly for for readers and they were as much on the case as the police were on the case they would be out there digging up facts and reporting on every little detail and the public would just would just eat it up it was it was really an incredible time I think that's what really started to, what struck me as I started to really get into the book and once my my rudimentary French, you know, and trying to pronounce the words in my head and some of the last names and things, I think once I kind of got into the groove of, of reading the book and it started to draw me in more and more, that's really what struck me is, I guess, how similar it sort of seems to now where we seem like people love a good crazy murder case and we see it on the news every single day and it's what seems to sort of kind of drive a lot of the, the sort of 24 7 news media so i think what really struck me was something that seems like it's from such a whole other time and era how similar it seemed to now and one of the things you kind of mentioned in there is what what gabrielle became is shamelessly self-promoting she laid the foundation for the modern criminal celebrity Right. And it's, I, I think, again, fascinating that this kind of story, I guess, hasn't been turned into, hasn't been turned into a film and isn't something we kind of know and talk about here in the States. Yeah, well, I would love for it to become a film. <laughs> Anybody who wants to make a film, let's talk. That's but, what I was going to say. You've, you've got the, the manuscript for it pretty well. Yeah. Um, there has been some talk of that, but nothing so far. But um, it does, it does lend itself beautifully to film partly because it's just so extravagant and the, and the scene scenery is so wonderful, but also th what you said about the, um, the nature of the crime and the way it was reported and the way people congregated around it. Um, she really was in some sense, a, a model for, 
um, the celebrities, the criminal celebrities we have today, starting with OJ and all the way on. Um, and she, she seemed to know that in a way that people hadn't known that before. And she was the perfect example of it because she was kind of attractive, um, kind of hysterical. Um, she was, you know, involved in a crime that itself was wildly sensational. Um, the way that they killed this guy was almost a theatrical event in itself. The way they, she lured him into an apartment and then basically they had rigged up a, an apparatus to hang him in there. Went through all of this, this wild um, effort where it could have been done a lot more simply, you would think, but it had to be theatrical. So the whole thing was theatrical and she was, she was an actress herself. And and so it talks about as she's kind of going around. Oh, I've had such a success on this tour, and the people come, and the crowds that come out, and they and they cheer me on. And and again, one of the quotes I think that someone says as they've started to tire, I think, of her antics in the public. We have come to assist in the glorification of a crime, and I think exactly. that speaks to sort of the two way street. Uh, I guess that we're still running down today in some ways. Exactly, exactly. And and you know you have to blame the media a lot for that as well. Um, they reported every little heartbeat of the case. They reported what she was eating in prison. They reported what she wore. Um, they just went to, to the limit on, on everything. But at the same time, you also have to blame the, the detective in the case as well, because he was a complete publicity hound. He was a great detective. Um, the, you know, a, a classic sort of gumshoe of the era with the, the long mustache, you know, waxed at the ends. And he carried a, a magnifying glass instead of a gun. And, you know, he was against the death penalty because he didn't think it did anything. Um, he wanted to use his wits instead of his, his, you know, weapons to bring in criminals. And he, you know, he set up the crime and, and, and investigated the crime in such a way that, that it created more hysteria. You probably remember in the book, he, in order to sort of get people to come out and, and tell him whatever he could, they could about the crime. If anyone had any details on it, he was totally stumped. He put the this um, um, trunk that the body was found in after they had killed him and they took him to another town and dumped him on a river, but they found the trunk. He put that on display in the Paris morgue, and that caused a huge sensation. Lines all the way down the block and you know tens of thousands of people lining up to come in and see it. But the way it was reported in the newspapers, it was reported as a theatrical event, almost like this was an opening of, an, of, a, of a theatrical show is, is really the words they used in the newspapers. And that's the way the French went after it. I mean, it was really a wild time. Sigmund Freud was around sometime around, around that era, a little bit before, but he got the sense of what the French were all about at that time and said that they were nothing like the people where he came from in Vienna. They were possessed of a certain demon, he thought. And it was true. There was something crazy going on in Paris. And and crazy things go on to to this day in Paris. And again, I find that that's sort of the reverberations through history. I, I, it's what fascinates me with the, with the media angle. And of course, that's that's why I called it media monarchy. Now, Gabrielle Bompard was on trial for the murder, but as well, sort of her her man, her handler, Aro, I believe is that is that the pronunciation? Aro. Oh, that's good. Yep. And and uh, Taylor made a suit for him to wear on trial because, hey, the great exposure for all my, my great Taylor work. I think, again, you could see that on the, on the you know, if you could have sort of the red carpet. Oh, who, who are you wearing? Exactly. You could see that happening today. Exactly the same. You know, if somebody's going to be out there in front of the media all the time, somebody's going to want to profit from it. Then as now, it's, it's, it is kind of incredible that, that, you know, as much as we change, we're really the same. So who, I guess, do you think in some ways, who was hypnotizing who? So it seemed that, you know, Gabrielle was a, a very great subject and was able to go under hypnosis very, very quickly. It was an easy subject. And, and time and time again, you kind of illustrate that in the book. But there's also, as we've now said, the public seemed sort of hypnotized by all of this. And it's, is it... Is it a two-way street? Is it one duping the other? Or, or how, do you have a personal opinion on that? I think it's definitely a two-way street. And even some of the cops and the investigators put it in those terms, I remember from some of the documents, that she was basically hypnotizing the public and that it was almost shameless and shameful that um, the public would be so easily, you know, attracted to her lures in a sense. And she knew that too. You know, she took, she took full advantage of it. 
Uh, another quote in the book that comes from sort of the critics as this as this spectacle went on and on. They must laugh abroad at the mental state of a society where such spectacles are possible. And I find I ask that question of, of, of us to this day. I mean, that's, I guess, again, getting to sort of the reverberations from then and now. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. But at the same time, if we think about it back then, though, too, um, the spectacle and the freedom and the craziness of Paris was something very special for others looking in from the outside in Europe. People used to come to Paris just for that reason, to be completely crazy. You know, you could do things there that you couldn't do in Germany, where it was a lot more uptight. And in, and in, and in England, where people were much more stuffy, they would leave those countries um, and go on, on holiday in Paris because um, anything was possible. And the story sort of shows that in a way. Is this some of the darkest work that you've kind of gotten into? <laughs> um, well, it, it was pretty dark. I mean, this is um, this is uh, some of the aspects of the of the of the uh, of the research and the story itself. I found were were pretty dark, um, as you read in the, in the book when they were doing the autopsy. Um, things got a little bit ghoulish because the body had been dumped on this riverbank and, and lay there for more than two weeks and decomposed quite a lot. It was completely naked. They had stripped the body and, and threw it there. Um, so it was almost impossible to determine who this person was. Um, and the person who did the, the first autopsy on the body was just you know, pulling away parts of flesh and hair and, and the internal organs were just like soup and whatnot. That got a little, a, a, you could say dark. <laughs> But that's the other aspect of the French time. At the time, there was this this element of the dark and the light. They were they had this great sense of gaiety and joy, and let's let's get drunk and drink absinthe, you know, which would make you hallucinate, and it would be a wonderful thing. But the reverse side of that, and as this crime sort of showed, was that there were some really dark, horrible aspects to the to the time as well. And the story did go on for a while. And actually, you you corrected me. I, I I bungled the the dates there at the beginning. It was 1889, and it did play out for a, a little while. And the public started to get sick of it, didn't they? They started to go, oh God, we're still watching this little demon, and they're still telling this story in in the media, right? Right. Well, you know, not to give away too much of it, but by the end, when she um, finally had. Um, I guess you could say, served her time and came out of prison. Um, she tried to continue her popularity. She missed her popularity terribly. And she tried to to reanimate the whole case by going, um, she tried to, tried to come to the U.S. actually and put on a show that demonstrated how she could be hypnotized and kill somebody, but not for real, but just sort of in a in a theatrical sort of way. And people in Paris weren't interested anymore. That's why she had to come to America and try to do it. But the Americans wouldn't let her in because um, she was a criminal and she was got stopped at customs. But, the, you know, the thing dragged on and people in the end sort of moved on. I mean, it was that's why I say it was really a moment in time and couldn't really have happened at another time. It just sort of happened to to blossom and explode right at that moment. But I can't help but think of, you already said, I can't help but think of OJ. Even after the sort of the trial and all these things happen, he comes, he's still around going, oh, well, let me write a book that talked about, you know, well, if hypothetically I did this thing, just oh. this, st just begging for celebrity still. Oh, sure. The, the media celebrity stuff is certainly still there. That happens all the time. But I just mean in terms of the the kind of crime and the nature of the the spectacle um, that sort of thing and the hypnotism aspect, you know, it sort of all kind of came together in that moment. But, um, that said, yeah, she did sort of establish this, um, this media mania for, you know, celebrities we can all love and hate at the same time and, and keep in the public eye. So, um, that's definitely there. Yeah. I, I really enjoyed the book. It's called Little Demon in the City of Light, a true story of murder and mesmerism in Belle Epoque, Paris. Stephen Livingston, any closing words about the book? I really appreciate your time here. I, I, I appreciate your interest. And um, no, I just, as I said, I just think it, the, the color and the, and, the, and the character of the, of the individuals in it, it was just, it was, kept me enthralled.
That's all. <laughs> it kept me enthralled as well. And as you can see, I've got a slew of notes here that I kept scribbling <laughs> down as I would read and even just trying to sort of because, again, it was it's very educational about the era, about the time, about even all of the studies into hypnotism and the Lijois school and the Tourette school. And right. again, it brought in so many elements that, that I find fascinating. And I and think that's why I really enjoyed the book. Oh, well, thanks so much. I appreciate hearing that. Absolutely. And, and, and again, it's really not that far fetched an idea that something like this would get turned into a film or at least, you know. So, something we'll, we'll we'll get our agents on it <laughs> let's work on that <laughs> Stephen right. Livingston thanks so much for coming on Media Monarchy man I appreciate it thanks a lot for having me take care <laughs>